resume our study of how we got the Bible. And uh, I do want to cover a couple of review items with you as I'm doing every week. I'm reminding you um, somewhat of where we're at in the study. Uh, we are still examining what I'm calling the transmission segment of this study, where we're examining how God's Word has been preserved and passed down over the centuries. And we've been focused on two main categories as it relates to the manuscripts we possess of the New Testament. As I've pointed out on, uh, on numerous occasions thus far, we have over 5,800 different manuscripts, Greek manuscripts specifically, of New Testament text. Now, not every manuscript has the entire New Testament. Uh, some of them are fragmentary, whereas some others are whole. Uh, we, but we, there are over 5,800 different manuscripts that pertain to the New Testament in the Greek language. And that's the most numerous collection of manuscripts for any ancient document in our possession today. Now, we do not possess an authentic, original, autographed copy of any text of the New Testament, or old for that matter. So we rely on the copies, the manuscript copies, that are in our possession to determine uh, what the original text of Scripture should be. And there are two main things we've noticed so far about manuscripts. The first was that manuscript age matters. The older a manuscript, the closer it gets us to the original writing and therefore is deemed most, more reliable. And we've also been looking here more recently, starting last week, at the fact that manuscript family matters. And what we observed last week is that there are different families or text types of manuscripts. What that means is that, that there, a family or a text type is a group of manuscripts that possess similar text of Scripture. There are variations between manuscript families. We're going to talk about that at length tonight. But there are three primary groups of uh, manuscript families, which we talked about last week. Uh, the first is the Alexandrian text type. The Alexandrian textual family is usually considered the oldest and most faithful in preserving the original text of the New Testament because the, the oldest documents we have and some of the most valuable documents we have fall in this family, so it's often referred to as the critical text. The second text we talked about was the Western family, the Western text type. It's primarily associated with Latin translations of the Greek New Testament. Uh, and this text type uh, uh, has a tendency to paraphrase a bit more. It's not used really in the efforts to translate the Bible into English, other than for comparison purposes when you come to a, a text that has variants. And then finally, there's the Byzantine text type. Now, the Byzantine family of manuscripts is sometimes referred to as the majority, of te majority text because the majority of the manuscripts in our possession today are of this textual family. And uh, that might make you think that this should be the most important textual family, but the problem is it has very few manuscripts that are really, really old. Most of its manuscripts are, are, are of the more recent variety, like from the 9th century onward as opposed to the earlier text of the 2nd, 3rd, 4th century that really comprised the Alexandrian text type. And so while the Byzantine text type has the, the majority of documents inside of it, it doesn't have the most valuable ones. Now the fact that there is more than one family of manuscripts means that the New Testament manuscripts that we possess today do not all read exactly alike. In other words, there are variances... Or, or different readings between the manuscripts of the New Testament. And a highly advanced science known as textual criticism has developed over the past several centuries and come up with a method for determining the value of a manuscript family and determining which reading is the best reading on any given passage. So I want to uh, go over this little bit of information we talked about last week at the end of class. Between the 5,800 Greek manuscripts of the New Testament, there are 200,000 known variants. Now, that number sounds worse than it actually is. If a single word were misspelled in 3,000 different manuscripts, they are counted as 3,000 variants. 
It could be the same word in all 3,000 manuscripts, misspelled the same way, but that still counts as 3,000 variants. So that number of 200,000 known variants is, is a little misleading. But it does help us understand that there are, there are lots of differences out there. They just may not be as significant as that number sounds. The other thing you need to know is that these variants appear in only about 10,000 places in the New Testament. And only about one sixtieth rise above the level of trivialities. You'll understand that statement as we go through this evening. The point is that none of the variants affect any of the basic doctrines of the Christian faith. The variants that we're going to look at tonight give a, a pretty good view of the mass, vast majority of variances you will in, encounter with the New Testament, and they don't affect any significant doctrinal teaching. And this has led to the summation and conclusion that the New Testament is 99% pure. What that means is that 99% of the text of the New Testament is unquestioned. There's no issues, there's no variances, there's no problems. 99%. Now, I know what you're thinking. If you're like me, you're thinking, well, there's still 1%, and that makes me uncomfortable. But tonight, what we're going uh, to do is examine why there are variances, how they come into existence. And you're going to see that it's not as big of a problem as it initially sounds. The other thing I want to point out to you is that next to the New Testament, the Iliad has more extant manuscripts than any other ancient book. So the New Testament has 5,800 manuscripts. The Iliad has 450, well, has a total of 643 manuscripts. Not bad, especially since the Iliad was written much earlier than the New Testament. And while the New Testament has about 20,000 lines, the Iliad has about 15,000. So they're, they're very close in length. Only 40 lines, or roughly 400 words of the New Testament, are in doubt, have issues, I should say. But there are 764 lines of the Iliad that have questions based on the manuscript evidence. So the New Testament has 20,000 lines, but only 40 of those lines have issues. The Iliad has 15,000 lines, but 764 of those lines have issues. I give you the numbers because it helps boost our confidence in the scriptures we possess. When you look at those numbers, what it means is that 5% of the Iliad has issues. In the New Testament, it's only 1%. You see, what we have to realize is that the number of manuscripts we possess creates variances, but resolves variances too. You see, you have to understand that there's a correlation between the number of copies made of a text and the number of variants that arise. In other words, the more manuscripts that are copied, the greater the possible number of errors that a copyist could make. But the presence of variants can actually be an asset in confirming or ascertaining the original text. So I put a, I put a sentence up on the screen with an error in it. It says, I will not fall asleep during Kyle's sermon with an error. And I want you to repeat that back to me. I'm just kidding. So you notice there's an error in it. There is a number sign where there should be a Y. So imagine that this is a New Testament manuscript. You receive it, you notice the error, but you can still figure out what the sentence is supposed to say, right? Now this is a very basic, very uh, watered-down um, illustration. But let's imagine you received another manuscript and it has this sentence with its error. Now you notice it's not the same error. There's two different errors. But what did that second manuscript just do for you? It just confirmed 
your understanding of the first manuscripts, the first sentence, because it shows you the letter that should have been there and vice versa. So what ends up happening, you have two documents with errors, but both documents help you confirm what the original statement should be, what the real statement is. And so while numerous manuscripts pose the problem of, cre- of, of giving you m- multiple variants, it also helps you to be able to do a compare-contrast and determine what the text should be. That's essentially what textual criticism does. Now, I've oversimplified that, but you'll see what I mean as we go through tonight. Because the goal of tonight's study is for you and I to examine some of these uh, uh, variants and come to an understanding of how they came into existence in the first place. Because there are answers, there are solutions to why some variants exist. And that's going to be the goal of our study tonight and a couple of weeks from now, because there's no way I'm going to be able to cover it all in one evening. So what we want to do tonight is we're going to break up the existence of variants that, that are in the New Testament manuscripts into two groups. In general, textual critics have classified uh, variants into two categories. Unintentional mistakes and intentional mistakes. And so as you journey through the comparison of New Testament manuscripts, what, you're go- what uh, textual critics have done, what these scholars have done, is they have viewed these mistakes as, hey, it's likely that this was unintentional or it was likely that this was intentional. And that sounds, when you hear that there are some that could be intentional, like you get the unintentional. Oh yeah, when that guy was copying that text by hand, he accidentally did this or that and made a mistake. It's the, when you hear the words intentional, that makes you a little bit nervous. But it's not intentional as in this person wanted to uh, uh, change God's word. In the instances we'll look at in a couple of weeks, we're only going to focus on unintentional tonight, but in a couple of weeks we'll look at intentional. And what you find out is it's not that this copyist wanted to uh, um, infringe upon God's word. Instead, he's trying to fix things that he thought were errors. We'll explain more when we get to that. But tonight we're going to focus on the unintentional errors, the mistakes that are made by copyists that weren't on purpose. In other words, there are some variants made by the copyists that were unintentional slips. And there are some variants that the copyists made deliberately. We're going to focus on the former. Unintentional mistakes are typically the result of a a visual or an auditory or a mental miscue. What I mean is that as they're reading and copying, their eyes trick them to some degree, or maybe they're making the copy by listening to somebody dictate the words and they hear something incorrectly. Or, or maybe, as they're making the copies, their memory of what they're supposed to be writing tricks them in some fashion, or they, they have an error in judgment, they misread, or, or something like that. Other reasons why there are unintentional mistakes could be imperfect handwriting. Let's remember, these guys aren't using computers or typewriters. They're writing these by hand, and, and you've seen handwriting that you couldn't completely understand sometimes. Maybe there's, a, maybe there's a handwriting issue where it looks like one letter, but it's really not that letter. Or maybe there's conditions environmentally. Maybe they didn't have good enough light, and they were transcribing at night, and they made a mistake. Anyway, Neil Lightfoot in his, uh, in his book, How We Got the Bible, which is a great resource for this study. It's one of many that I use. He says, Mistakes of the hand, eye, and ear are of frequent occurrence in manuscripts, but usually pose no problem because they are so easy to pick out. So let's pick some of those out tonight. I'm going to show you six different ways in which an unintentional mistake could have occurred. And the first is simply going to be called the wrong division of words. Now, when we talked about the different types of manuscripts that exist, 
we noted that there's a type called an unseal. Does anybody remember what was distinct about an unseal? All capital letters, no spaces. So, what likely happens, at least on occasion, is that the copyist, as he is copying that unsealed text onto a new document, he sees all capital letters, no spaces, and maybe he incorrectly divides the terminology. So wrong division of words occurs particularly when copying an unsealed manuscript, and the copyist incorrectly divides the words. I've already put an example from English up there. You've already looked at it probably. Imagine that you saw that phrase that's in all capital letters there on the screen. How would you divide that into a sentence? I heard he is now here, but did anybody else think he is nowhere? Obviously, you have two options here. Which one's the correct option? That can happen when your manuscript is all capital letters with no spacing. No punctuation, for that matter. So that's an example in English. Now let's look at one that happens actually in Scripture. So this is Mark chapter 10 and verse 40. You can feel free to compare this to your English translation. But that's what Mark chapter 10 and verse 40 would look like in Greek unseals. All capital letters. Y'all go ahead and divide that out into words for me. That's, that's all capital letters. No punctuation, no spacing. I want you to focus in on these five or six letters that are in red. Now, you have no idea, other than a handful of you, what letters those are. But the letters in red could be divided two ways. They could be divided into two words. And what I've done, I've put on this line, if you can read it, I've shown you the two words in all caps, and then I've shown you the two words in lowercase with with punctuation. That's one option. So when a copyist was copying Mark chapter 10 and verse 40, he could split this phrase of six letters into two words, or he could have retained it as one word. It could be a single word. And again, I've placed it in all caps and then also in lowercase, so you can see Lowercase is a lot easier to, to read in Greek, for the record. Now, you don't know Greek, so you don't know either of those words. I, you probably don't even know how to pronounce that, except you can make out an A, an O, and an I, which is correct. That's alpha, omega, and, and iota there. But other than that, you may not be able to figure out the rest of the word. So let me move it over into English. In Mark chapter 10 and verse 40, we have a recording of Jesus' response to James and John's request to be seated next to him when he enters his kingdom. And based on the Greek of that sentence and how it could be broken into two different words, there are two different options of translation. Let me pull this back up, okay. And so if the two-word division is correct, If the two-word division is correct, then the verse is saying that the seats beside Jesus are reserved for certain ones who have already been designated. In other words, he's saying, okay, those seats have already been assigned, and they might include you, James and John. You might be the ones who who have been uh, chosen for those seats. If it's a two-word division, that's how it would be read or interpreted. But if it's a one-word division, then it's saying that the seats beside Jesus are reserved for other people, which means James and John have been excluded. I almost said executed. That was incorrect. Excluded. So it's not a significant change in meaning, but depending on how you um, decide to divide those six letters in the midst of that all-capital, no-spacing sentence, changes the understanding of the sentence, not in any way that affects doctrine, not in any way that affects theology, 
but it does affect translation. So that's how a situation of, with the wrong division of words would play out. There are a couple of other examples, but I'm going to move on to a second way in which variants occur. And that is with the confusion of letters. Have you ever read somebody, somebody's writing and you thought they wrote one letter when in fact they were writing a different letter of the alphabet? Same thing can happen in Greek. Remember, the manuscripts we're talking about, this, these 5,800 manuscripts are all handwritten. And so there's, not, uh, there's the, the, the possibility, at the very least, of misreading a letter of the Greek alphabet. So let me show you a few letters from the alphabet and how uh, they could be uh, misconstrued at times. So you have the letter theta, and all these are the capital versions, capital letters, because that's an unseal again. You have theta, you have omicron, and you have sigma. Now that's not the, the sigma we learn in, in normal Greek in, in college. This is an alternative symbol for sigma, sigma that was used um, later. But imagine you have three different letters that utilize essentially a circle. Theta has a line in the middle of that circle. The, the alternative sigma letter doesn't have a complete circle, but, but imagine as you're sitting as a, a copyist or a scribe and you're transcribing from one manuscript onto a new one and you've got to determine which letter that is. And maybe you're trying to figure out, is that a smudge or was that intended to have a line in the middle of it? Then there's gamma and pi and tau, the G, the P, the T, basically, of Greek alphabet. Now, they don't look like they would be that complicated, but now you're having to decide as you have those vertical lines and, and you're looking at that horizontal line across the top. Did that horizontal line make a perfect 90 degree angle or was it trying to uh, put the vertical line, did, did, was the horizontal line trying to make a, a perfect 90 degree angle and make a, 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 a gamma or was it trying to center the vertical line and make a tau? Am I seeing uh, uh, two vertical lines or just the one? You can see how that can get a little bit complicated. Then you get to the third row, delta and lambda, your D and your L in the Greek alphabet. How they both have a triangular shape to them. The only difference is one has a bottom line, the other doesn't. And then on the, on the fourth row here, I have a double lambda. That's two L's and a mu which is an M. And you can imagine in handwriting those two L's could appear like an M, or an M could appear like two L's. Those are the kind of issues that can happen in the manuscript with handwriting in particular. So I expect by next week you all have perfect Greek knowledge, okay? Anyway, let me give you a couple of examples of how this shows up in Scripture. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 5, there is a conjunction that appears. It's the letters Alpha, Lambda, Lambda, Alpha, A-L-L-A, -L -L -A, if you will. And that, that word simply means nevertheless, however, or yet. In fact, if you go to Romans chapter 6 and verse 5, it actually is one of those conjunctions that doesn't get translated into English because it's unnecessary for English to have it. It makes sense without having to translate that specific word. So you have this word appear in the Greek text, but there are some manuscripts that preserve the, the letters A, excuse me, Alpha, Mu, Alpha, A-M-A, -A, which means at the same time or together, something like that. It's a situation where uh, somewhere along the way the copyist mis mistook the two capital L's for an M and copied it incorrectly. There's another example in Jude, the 12th verse. Jude, the 12th verse, makes reference to agapes. Now, you might recognize the core of that word, agape, love. In this instance, it's translated as love feasts. But some manuscripts preserve the word apates because the gamma someone misinterpreted as a pie, 
And then someone misinterpreted a pi as a tau. Two different letters in, those, in that one word get misconstrued as they copied it. And here's the thing. Agapes is a reference to love feasts here. Apates is the word for deceit. Now, if you read Jude verse 12, deceit does not fit into the context of the verse at all. But there are some manuscripts that preserve that spelling of that particular word. So confusion of the letters can lead to variance as well. Now let me get you to a third way in which some variants appear in the New Testament. It's called dittography. Now I'm certain you all know what dittography is, but let me tell you uh, uh, the definition we're going to use tonight. Dittography occurs when a copyist accidentally repeats a letter, a syllable, or a word which should be written only once. So let me give you an example. You've probably done this particularly on your computer when you're typing up some sort of document. Maybe a paper, maybe a, a, an email, I, I don't know. But if you look at this sentence, Kyle is teaching tonight's Bible class. You see the double T in tonight's? That would be dittography, an accidental, unintentional double letter. Another way it can happen is if you have two of the same word. Kyle is, is teaching tonight's Bible class. The second is wasn't meant to be there. It was an accident. And it doesn't keep you from understanding the sentence. You just look at it and you want to whip out your red pen and edit it. But those two examples are examples of dittography. Now this happens a good bit in Scripture, actually. Let me show you the first example. I've only got two, but let me show you this first example. This has to do with Acts chapter 19 and verse 34. And it also has to do with one of the most important uh, manuscripts in our possession, Codex Vaticanus. You may remember when we reviewed these documents last week and the week before, Codex Vaticanus is a, a bound uh, book of uh, animal skin documents that contain almost the entire New Testament, and it's re preserved in the Vatican. It is dated to the uh, 4th century. It's one of the oldest codices that we possess, and it is one of the most valuable documents for translation, but it has an episode of dittography in Acts chapter 19 and verse 34. If you look at Acts chapter 19 and verse 34, you'll see that there is this phrase, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Right at the end of the sentence, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Now, in most Greek manuscripts, in a standard Greek manuscript, this is what it would look like. I've highlighted the phrase that's translated, great is Artemis of the Ephesians in red. Now, this is what Codex Vaticanus looks like. It puts the entire phrase twice. It repeats that entire phrase. So it says, great is Artemis of the Ephesians, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. It had an episode of dittography happened right there in this valuable document. And it's quite evident from other manuscripts that it should only be there once. So, this is a variant. Does it affect anything major? No. Does it change the understanding of the passage? Absolutely not. But let me show you another potential case of dittography. Scholars actually debate this one, but it's very interesting. It has to do with 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 7, and I would encourage you to look at this passage. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 7. The Greek text of this verse in some manuscripts appears as the top line. Now, I don't know how well you can see the coloring there, but the second word ends in what's called a new letter of the alphabet, in U. It's the N of the Greek alphabet, but for us it looks like a V. It's one of the more confusing aspects of the Greek alphabet. But the second word ends in, v, in a V for your purposes, ends in an N for Greek purposes. And then the first letter of the third word it has the very same letter. But then there are other manuscripts that don't have the 
V for you, N for Greek, on that third word. Can you see the variance there between the two? I know my font's not very big. But on the top line, you have two V's, N's, back to back if this was an unseal. On the second line, you only have one if it's an unseal. I'll show you an unseal in a second. Now here's the issue. The first version, the top line leads to the translation, we were babes among you. And I've cited some uh, New Testament translations, English translations that use that type of terminology. The second line leads to the translation, we were gentle among you. And I've cited the New Testament or the English translations that use that terminology. We were babes among you or we were gentle among you. Either one can work in context. But some scholars believe that copyists unintentionally repeated the letter new, causing the change in terminology. And this is how it would look in an unseal. You would have back-to-back ends. Now, isn't that confusing? The capital letter is a capital N. The lowercase letter is a V. But it's possible that when these manuscripts were copied, someone doubled up a letter that didn't need to be doubled up. Some scholars believe that Paul would have likely used, how, I should say, however, some scholars believe that this is not a case of ditography, that this is the way Paul wrote it because Paul would use the language of being a babe or a child. That was a terminology he used more than he did the term for gentle. But it's a possible case of ditography where a repeated letter or phrase or word occurs. So that's another situation in which that creates variances. Now let me tell you about this one, homoteleuton. This occurs when a copyist accidentally omits a word or group of words because his eyes skip to a similar word or group of words found later in the passage. Have you ever been reading, whether it's the Bible or any, any book or anything that you, that you read, have you ever been reading, take your eyes off of the text, and then when you return to the text, you know what word or phrase you need to return to, and it just so happens that word or phrase is repeated on the same page somewhere else, and you catch the later appearance of that word or phrase and pick up several sentences later. I've done this numerous times when I'm working with bank statements. When I'm trying to balance my bank account, and I'm looking over here, I've got my statement over here, I've got my uh, accounting software over here, and I, I find this number, now I'm going to go reconcile it over here, and when I go back, oh, that number is, that, I go to Chick-fil-A a lot, and I order the same thing every time. So on my bank statement, on one page, you could have like 20 different Chick-fil-A's at the same price, and I might catch the wrong one, and then I've skipped several lines of other items that I need to be reconciling. I've had numerous times where I've gotten to the end of the statement, and I'm like, this doesn't add up. I must have skipped something, and I have to go start the whole thing all over again because my eye caught the wrong line. You ever been there? Whether you're reading or doing accounting, it doesn't matter. Well, that happened to some of the scribes, some of the copyists, because there are numerous times where they would be looking at a document, and they're copying it over here, and when they go back to the document, they look for the phrase they just copied, and it just so happens that a few lines later, there's that phrase, and they've skipped everything in between. Let's look at a few examples from, in Scripture. Go to John chapter 17, verse 15. Now, it will help you to look at the English translation of these passages, because you'll see rep the repeated phrases on some occasions. Not so much on this one, though. In John chapter 17, verse 15, it says this, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. Now, the highlighted section in red is absent from Codex Vaticanus. Yes, that very document we looked at a moment ago that repeated, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. That same important document does not have the, the words, the world, but that you keep them from. And this is a case of homoteleoton. 
Because here is John chapter 17, verse 15 in the Greek. I've highlighted two words, et tu. You'll see them twice in this passage in Greek. And so those two words frame that phrase that is left out of Codex Vaticanus. It's likely that after the copyist wrote the first ek tu, which is translated out of in English, he likely looked back at the text and inadvertently found the second ek tu, which is translated from in the English, and resumed copying at that point. Ek tu works as a preposition. Ek is a preposition. And in Greek, prepositions can be translated many different ways. And in this case, you have one, in English, one occasion is going to be translated out of, the other occasion is going to be translated from. But it's a great instance of a verse actually utilizing similar terminology, even though it translates different in English. And so what happens is the copyist looks at the first Ek 2, records it, looks back, finds the second Ek 2, and picks up from there, leaving out everything in between. Now, I'll give you an even easier example to follow. This is Luke chapter 10 and verse 32. Luke chapter 10 and verse 32 is absent from Codex Sinaiticus. Now, this is another one of the major documents that we use for translation. It's another really important 4th century codices found at the monastery on Mount Sinai. Codex Sinaiticus and Codex uh, Vaticanus are the two most important documents used for, for uh, Greek uh, for, for creating the Greek manu- uh, the, the basis of the Greek New Testament. And this verse is actually missing from Codex Sinaiticus. Now here is Luke chapter 10, verse 31 and 32 in Greek. And you'll notice I've highlighted in red a word that appears at the end of both verses. If you go look in your English translation, you'll notice that this is from the parable of the Good Samaritan. And the word translates to the phrase, passed by on the other side. And you may notice that that terminology appears at the end of verse 31 and the end of verse 32. So here's what likely happened. The copyist likely wrote the first appearance of this term, which is translated passed by on the other side in the English Standard Version. He likely wrote the first appearance of this word in verse 31, then picked up the reading when he looked back at it at verse 32. And what ends up happening is everything in verse 32 gets left out. Going back to the English real quick. I didn't put the English on there. Never mind. My apologies. So what you have is the location of the word in one verse, Write it, you go back, and you locate it in the other verse and resume from there. Here's another great example. It's from Matthew chapter 5. This is in Codex Sinaiticus again. Also, another codex has this problem, Codex Bizet. It was one we, looked, we talked about as well, uh, that Codex Bizet was largely uh, used for the original English translations. It was one of the main codices available in the King James translation. Uh, was made. But what's interesting is you have Matthew chapter 5, verse 19 and 20. I've written it here in English, and I've uh, made a couple of uh, modifications to it. In bold, I've highlighted a phrase that appears three times between the two verses, and that phrase is simply the kingdom of heaven. What's highlighted in red on your screen is the section that's missing from Codex Sinaiticus. What's highlighted in in blue, along with what's highlighted in red, is missing from Codex Bizet. Can you guess what happens? What happens here is the copyist looks at the phrase, the kingdom of heaven, transcribes it onto the new document, and then goes back to the text to find where he left off, and the guy that is transcribing Codex Sinaiticus finds the second appearance of that phrase which is at the very end of verse 19, and picks up from there. So therefore he omits everything from the first appearance of the kingdom of heaven to the last appearance of the kingdom, or to the second appearance of the kingdom of heaven. Then the guy who's transcribing Codex Bizet, he goes a step further. He records the first appearance of that phrase, the kingdom of heaven. And then when he goes back to the text, he finds the third appearance of that phrase. 
which is at the end of verse 20. And so what he ends up doing is cutting out half of verse 19 and all of verse 20 when he picks up. This is homotelia time. This is what happens when your eyes deceive you and you go back to the text and you resume recording by finding the same statement or word that appears multiple times on the same page. This is what it would look like in Greek. You can see that phrase bolded three times to represent the phrase, the kingdom of heaven. The red font indicates what was left out of Codex Sinaiticus, and the blue font, as well as the red font, represents what was left out of Codex Bizet. So, like I said, what ends up happening is they find the wrong appearance of that phrase and continue writing from there. That's homoteluton, which is, becomes a, a prominent way in which some of these variants occur. Now, that's a pretty significant passage. That's a pretty well-known passage, Matthew chapter 5, verse 19 and 20. But even though it's a popular passage, what ends up happening, these variants, we're able to pull, pick them out because the evidence of their inclusion is overwhelming in comparison to the two documents that I've mentioned that failed to have it. Other documents failed to have it too, but there's overwhelming evidence for those two verses, so they are retained. And even if they weren't retained, there is nothing doctrinally that, it, that, that does not appear elsewhere in Scripture to make up for the absence of these verses. Let's go to one more. Another text, way textual variants occur is called homophones. Now you know what a homophone is. It's when you have a couple of words that sound exactly the same, but spelled differently and have different meanings. So I've included some English homophones, like the word there. Am I referring to the, the contraction of they are? Am I referring to a, a location? Or am I referring to a group of people? By, am I... Uh, I'm not even going to try to go through every word. But you have all these different homophones. Hear, meet, new, no. Every one of those has a different meaning, even though they sound exactly the same. That happens in Greek, too. They have words that sound exactly the same, but are spelled differently and have different meanings. And now you have to think about this. The issue with homophones happens particularly when you encounter a situation where the copyists aren't looking at a document and making copies. Instead, they're in a group. And this was done by scribes. They would gather a group of scribes, and they'd have somebody read the text. Scribes would write down as it's being read aloud. And so the homophone issue occurs particularly when a copyist is transcribing from dictation, and the copyist unintentionally misspells a word because it sounded to him like a different word. So, let's look at a couple of examples. Romans chapter 5 and verse 1. The manuscripts present two different readings, Romans chapter 5 and verse 1, or two different spellings would be a better way for me to say this. So if you look at the second word in both of the phrases that I have on the screen, you can see that in the top line, there's the O letter, that's the Omicron, letter of the Greek alphabet. On the second line, you'll see there's a W letter in the middle of that word. The W is called omega. Now, here's the thing. One of the unique things about the Greek alphabet is that the, o, the omicron and the omega are both O sounds. One is more of a short O. Omicron, the one that looks like an O, is a short O. Omega, the one that looks like a W, is a long O. But oftentimes, when you say the words, it can sound very much the same. If you look at Romans chapter 5, 1 and compare it in English translations, you'll come across some translations that utilize the Omicron, the O, and that leads to the translation, we have peace with God. English Standard Version, King James Version, New American Standard, NIV, uh, NLT, they, New King James, they all sub subscribe to that translation. But if you go with the Omega 
version of this word. It leads to the translation, let us have peace with God. And the translations that typically use that are not ones that are going to be familiar to you necessarily. The difference is simply whether the highlighted Greek vowel is long O or short O. And it's one of those situations where the pronunciation of that word ekumen could have been misunderstood by the copyists when they were hearing it. And they spelled it, one or the other spelled it incorrectly. It doesn't change the meaning that much, but it does uh, affect the mood of the sentence. We have peace with God, something that currently exists, or let us have peace with God are the two options. The latter of which doesn't indicate it already exists. It indicates that it's something to be pursued. Another example is 1 John chapter 1 and verse 4. The manuscript evidence is divided between two readings here. And if you look at the two sentences, you'll go down to um, one of the later words. You either have a U-shaped letter or an N-shaped letter. The U is upsilon. Uh, the N-shaped one is eta. Did I say that right, Ben? Okay. Um, the former, the U-shaped word, leads to the translation that your joy may be full. The N-shaped word leads to the translation that our joy may be full. The difference between your and our in this sentence is one letter. And the two words sound alike. Your, the, the, the translation your is human. The translation our is hemon. And so it would be very easy for a copyist to incorrectly hear a, someone dictating this passage and spell the word incorrectly. Human or Hamon. One more example of homophones comes from Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5. Uh, Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5, manuscripts have two different readings. Look at the second word of each of these lines. You'll notice that the top one has an O and a U-shaped letter. The bottom one just has the U. They are both pronounced the same, lusanti, but they mean two different things. Now, you'll also notice I've got two words in blue. We'll deal with those in a minute. But for right now, we're focused on homophones, and so I want you to focus on the ones in red. The former word with the U and the O, the O and the U, it leads to the translation, and washed us from our sins. You'll see this in the King James and the New King James. The latter statement with just the U-shaped letter leads to the translation, freed us from our sins. The ESV, the, the New American Standard, the NIV, they all use this version. Now, there's not a lot of difference there. We, we can theologically understand that being washed of your sins is the same as being freed from your sins. So from a, from a, a translation standpoint, it really doesn't affect us too much. The problem is both words are pronounced the same. The only difference is whether or not the word should uh, be spelled one way or the other. But both are pronounced lusante. And a copyist who's listening to this, this dictated to him might transcribe the wrong spelling as he hears it. One last category, and we'll probably run a little bit over, but I do want to finish. This is the last thing in my notes for tonight on unintentional mistakes that lead to textual variance. That's the issue of synonyms and parallels. Now what happens here is that, that this variant occurs when a copyist forgets the precise word in a passage and either substitutes a synonym for that word or at least similar biblical terminology. Uh, one author said errors could occur when scribes trying to retain a line in their memory accidentally replaced some words with close synonyms such as would be the case with prepositions. Here's an example. Using that Revelation 1 passage again, I'd highlighted two words in blue on the previous slide just to acknowledge that they were different. But here I highlight them in red because that's our focus. They're both prepositions. The first one, uh, the first line uses the letters alpha, pi, omicron. It's pronounced apo. Apo is a Greek preposition that indicates a state of separation 
and it's typically translated from or away from or because of. On the second line, you see the letters e, e K, uh, Epsilon, and Kappa. Pronounced ek. Ek is also a great Greek preposition that expresses separation, and it's typically translated out of, from, or since. In other words, both of these prepositions can be translated in very same way. They can be used interchangeably with no change in meaning. So it's possible that a copyist inadvertently substituted the wrong preposition at some point in time. Does it change the meaning of the sentence? Absolutely not. It doesn't even affect the sentence. You would translate the sentence the same way with either word. That's an occasion where a synonym was inserted. But there are occasions where a statement from another section of the Bible is substituted. Let me show you this example from Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 9. You'll notice on the screen, this is the Greek of different manuscripts of Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 9. The top line has a very different word ending that phrase than the bottom line. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 9. Oop, I need to scroll down to it. If it takes the top line, that phrase would say this in English, for the fruit of the Spirit. The bottom line, the second text on the screen in Greek, is translated for the fruit of light. You have pneumatos on the top line, which means spirit, and you have photos on the bottom line, which means light. If you go to Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 9, you'll notice that the King James Version retains the phrase, for the fruit of the Spirit, while the English Standard Version retains the phrase, for the fruit of light. What's li- what likely happened here is that a copyist is transcribing this text and comes, al- comes to the phrase, for the fruit of, and for whatever reason, substitutes the phrase from Galatians chapter 5 and verse 2 here. For the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. That's not what Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 9 is saying, though. It was an accidental insertion, likely because the um, copyist was quoting Scripture in his head as he copied it. Because if I start a sentence with for the fruit of, you're not going to finish it with light. You're going to finish it with Spirit, because that's such a popular passage. So sometimes even this could happen, where an accidental... um, a parallel passage is used as they're transcribing from one manuscript to another. So the last example of a way in which a textual invariant can occur unintentionally is with synonyms or parallels. Six different ways an unintentional mistake could occur in a manuscript. And they're all so simple. The truth is, if you and I were having to function as copyists, we could make every one of those mistakes. In an hour. It'd be easy. But did you also notice as we went through these that none of the mistakes we looked at tonight were that significant? That it was even easy for us to comprehend them, even easy for us to to negotiate with them, easy for us to see how they were made, easy for us to see how they could be resolved. And not once did it affect doctrine, theology, that sort of thing. Because the majority of these variants are just like that. Not that significant and easy to resolve. So we're going to conclude there. In two weeks we'll come back and we'll look at some other types of variants, some that are intentional, and we'll also deal with some of the big, big sections of Scripture that have bigger issues. Like why a whole section of a chapter is omitted in some manuscripts. I thank you for your attention. Let's close out with a quick word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you grateful for a night of study. It is our prayer that what we've examined tonight has been beneficial to us, has uh, emboldened our faith. Lord, help us to leave here and to shine for you in the world around us. Help us to represent you well. Thank you, Lord, for your love, your grace, your mercy, your forgiveness. It's through your son's name that we pray. Amen.